Welcome to another edition of Homeschooling Help with Andrea Schwartz, sponsored by the Calcedon Foundation. And as usual, I am joined by my co-host, Nancy Wilk. And Good as morning. we said before, hey there, as we've said before, neither one of us are actively homeschooling children at this point, but we both have our hands in the mix. More so for me as a mentor and someone who coaches, you might say, people through their homeschooling experience. But Nancy has a little deeper involvement in that her grandchildren are being homeschooled by their parents. And she also um, sponsors through her uh, family ministry business, Church in Maine, uh, an aspect of helping homeschool families with the Appomattox Area Homeschooling Association. And that's why um, I always rely on Nancy to bring the questions that are coming her way. And today's topic is one that came by means of someone who was talking to Nancy about this subject. So I'm going to turn it over to Nancy to kind of get us started. Great. Thank you, Andrea. It's always a pleasure. Um, last weekend was the um, uh, Homeschool Educators Association of Virginia annual conference. And Don and I, as leaders in the homeschool community here, we had opportunity to host the um, homeschool support group table. We had somebody come to our table who was only came to our table by accident because the table she was supposed to go to didn't have a representative. But her question was about testing. So in her state of uh, Maryland, it was not required that they test, but she thought, you know, homeschoolers do great. Um, I'll test mine to prove it. Well, the child didn't do as well as mom had anticipated. Mom was heartbroken. You know, I mean, you can imagine. And so um, we we got to talk to her and explain, you know, a little bit about, you know, what what testing does and what it doesn't do. But I thought for all those all those moms out there that sometimes get that, you know, sinking feeling either before or after they test that we should talk about that. So um, I know you've got homeschool test stories. Everybody's got test stories, but um, I'd like to hear yours, but also consider what tests are really for and do we need them and why? So there we okay. go, Andrea. Let's go. Right. So you end up with a philosophy of things like testing in the homeschool once you play around with doing it and realizing, I don't have any clue why I'm doing this. So it's always a good idea in whatever you're doing, homeschooling notwithstanding, is to know why you're doing a certain thing. If you're doing it because, well, everybody else is doing it, that's going to have its limitations. Um, so people can choose to test or not. When I started, I was part of a satellite school. At the time, it was Calcedon Christian School. Um, I was one of their remote families and they sponsored or helped homeschooling families. And so once a year, we would do these tests. Well, we had a really funny experience the first year because I was watching how my son answered questions. Now, standardized tests are the average understanding. So one of the questions included three pictures, which can ha carry the heaviest load? There was a picture of a wheelbarrow. There was a picture of a suitcase. And there was a picture of a pail. My son answered the suitcase. Well, of course, that's considered wrong. But at the time, his father was doing the kind of work that required every time he went on a trip to take this massive suitcase that was so heavy and hard to pick up. So in a lot of ways, his answer was the correct answer based on his experience. So you have somebody who's formulating a test and they're usually looking for a standard procedure or a standard way of looking at something. So by and large, a wheelbarrow is going to usually be able to carry more, but that wasn't part of my son's experience. And so I got to see a limitation of a standardized test. Mm -hmm. So that, if, yeah. a kid, excuse me, if a kid lives in an apartment complex in New York, he might not have ever even seen a wheelbarrow to know what that's about. Exactly. So when we look at our standardized tests, we have to have a context of 
who's formulating the tests and what exactly are they measuring and by whose standard. Mm -hmm. The second funny testing story is when we started, as my son was older and my uh, next child, a daughter as well, they would get the results and the results would be um, which percentile they were in. And sometimes it would give the grade level. And so it was post high school. Well, of course, at the time, my husband didn't understand how these things were done. And he was like, oh, my goodness, our fourth and fifth grader, post high school, he can go to college. And I went, uh, not exactly. Um, post high school means he did as well as the average post high school student, which if you think about it in fourth grade, that's kind of sad. In other words, that means that we have a bunch of people walking around who have graduated from high school and uh, they know as much as a fourth grader. As your so, fourth grader. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it, as far as understanding even what the testing results mean, the fact that you might be in the 90th percentile, that means if every child tested, your child was in the top 10%. Okay. Okay. But if you don't understand the logic behind how this is being adjudicated, you might have a false sense of we're doing great or we're not doing great. Right. right. The third story, the third story is with my youngest. And she was at an age where I was administering the test where it was OK to ask the questions and see how she did. Well, she was excited beyond belief. She was taking a test. This was great. And I don't think she got one answer right. So I can totally relate to the woman you talked to because I was like, oh my goodness, I've already taken two children through this grade level and my daughter is, is failing abysmally. Well, at the time, like I said, we were part of Calcedon Christian School and I called up Darlene Rush Dooney and I said, I'm such a failure. And she gave me, this was, you know, the early mid nineties. Um, and she, she gave me the equivalent of chill out. I mean, really, are you that concerned what your five-year-old is doing? Look at this as an opportunity to evaluate yourself rather than evaluate the child. She says, whatever you do, if your daughter asks you how she did, don't make it about the results. Say, did you like taking the test? Oh, that was great. And realize that there was some work you had to do. So if I had to say one thing about testing... Testing should be a reflection on the teacher rather than a reflection on the student. Right. And it also, we have to remember that any test only measures the material that's on it. It's only a measure of that material. And it doesn't measure things outside of that. Right. So, uh, you know, some, some state, uh, well, every state has different laws. And some of them require testing and some of them don't. So, um, and I, I think that there's different types of tests. Some of them measure that, that student's individual progress or achievement. Some of them might measure the, um, how they compare to other students on their, their grade level. But bear in mind, most of those students on their grade level are actually public school students. And those teachers have been teaching the material that's on the test. And your family might be busy doing something else instead of preparing for that specific test. Exactly. See, when you teach the test, what you're saying is there's a right answer to everything in life. Well, mm -hmm. we know that the standardized tests don't include knowledge of God's law. What's the fifth commandment? Um, what uh, you're supposed to do in the case of an emergency or how you view health and nutrition. And so it really is a very, very narrow set of testing elements. So they're going to test reading. They're going to test writing. They're going to test listening comprehension, math skills. All of those are fine. But if you put too much credence in the result, as opposed to preparing your children for adult life, which is what education is all about, mm -hmm. you might abandon the things that are truly most important. I mean, how sad is it, Nancy, that a lot of kids get to college, don't know how to do their own laundry, 
and can't uh, cook a meal. Right. You know, but <coughs> pardon me, maybe that they can uh, diagram a sentence. Right. And maybe they cannot read as well as your fourth grader. Exactly. So that post high school result was indicative, excuse me, <coughs> was indicative of the fact that my son and daughters were good readers. And right. by the way, the youngest eventually caught up and did just fine on those tests, but I didn't put the pressure on her or me that said, you know, we have to get a good grade here because quite frankly, the results ended up in a folder and no one else besides me ever cared. Right. 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 In our particular state, it is required that, um, that students that do not take the religious exemption are tested. And um, the test, uh, the test requires, let me see, it says it requires a um, composite score of above the 23rd percentile. Now, 23rd percentile is the bottom 25 percent. It's it's below average. And well that below. Only, pardon me? Well below average. Well below average. Um, 23 third percentile in the composite, the required composite test is only measured by your math and language arts. So take out history, take out science, take out, you know, all, take out God, take out their social skills, take out their social skills, only math and language arts. They have to do better than failing, actually. Right. So that we now have a philosophical thing we have to address here. Does God's law give the civil government the authority and jurisdiction to test people's academic knowledge? I think you could go through the Bible from cover to cover, back and forth, with an eye for answering that question, and you would find out it does not. The responsibility right. lies with the parents, lies with the family. And so when some bureaucrat decides that your son or daughter has to end up in, you know, at least in the low 25th percentile of other people who are tested, I would say that we're operating with an abysmal standard, one that's ungodly. And depending on the state and depending on the situation, you may have to go through the motions but look at it as turning the other cheek and walking the extra mile rather than anything truly beneficial. Mm, right, right, right. Because if you don't take the religious exemption, you have to test. And so what we need to do is just say, I tested, and then put the paper in the file. Okay. So let me say this about the woman you spoke to a couple of weekends ago, and that okay. is... She really does need a benchmark on how well she's doing. But if she doesn't have a mission statement in place, and we've talked about this before, if she doesn't have a way in which to measure how she's doing in terms of why she's homeschooling, then she's going to have to default to someone else's standards. And what happens is, and this you see this in the younger grades, they don't do as well in standardized testing because they haven't been sitting in a classroom situation, raising their hands. And you said being given the, <coughs> excuse me, the test questions, but later on they do much better because they've read their vocabulary is so good. So by and large uh, homeschool students don't necessarily need to take all the SAT prep classes because they don't have to uh, wonder about good vocabulary. They've read the classics. They are voracious readers usually. And so that's where they pick up their reading ability and their skills, not because we want to be good readers and pass the vocabulary portion of a standardized test, because their parents want them to know about life, know about history, know about science from a godly perspective. But if you really want to get an education, check out some of the questions on these standardized tests. They presuppose evolution. They presuppose socialism. They presuppose that uh, 
you know, uh, the white person is always oppressing the person of color. And you see, so those ideas infiltrate even into the questions. Mm. And so that's why I said, don't put too much stock in how your children answer. Maybe they're getting the wrong answer really means they have the right thinking. And that's a good thought. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Let me see if I, if I have some other questions here. Um, let me say this while you're looking. Okay. A really good, unthreatening way to evaluate your child, especially people who are involved in homeschool associations, be willing to let another homeschool mom have some time with your homeschool student, asking questions, seeing, you know, what sort of questions your student asks. Because I think it was Sam Blumenfeld who first told me this, so I attribute it to him. Maybe he didn't make it up. But you know how well somebody is learning, not so much by the answers they give, but by the questions they ask. And so by having a conversation with a child, You'll find out pretty well, you know, do you read a lot? Is it a struggle for you? What's your favorite subject? Things like that. And then the other parent can come alongside and say, I think you need to focus a little bit more on this, in which case it's non-threatening. It's not you're a failure. Right. Because I've seen homeschool settings where the parents were musicians, the children were fabulous musicians, but maybe they weren't as good in math skills, which is kind of funny because in order to be a musician, you have to know math when you look at all the different notes and the time signatures, but sometimes the standardized textbook math isn't. So again, it goes back to what do the parents think is important? And uh, if you think geography is important, great. If you think spelling is important, great. Help your child excel at something so that when the difficult subjects come, you're in a position to say, okay, you know, we're not going to all be great at everything, but we can all be good enough. Mm -hmm. right. right. Yeah. So one of the things we want to talk about is how do you measure if your child or your family is growing in the nurture and admonition of board? Because we know that is the most important thing. The academics are really more a way to communicate and to interact in our, our, in creation and in our culture, the truths about God. So if we are successful in identifying our mission statement and, and looking and seeing how are we really doing that, or what are some other ways that we can use to measure success and so that when we are um, taking assessment and taking a stock where we're really measuring the right things. Okay. My husband had a phrase he loved. You must inspect what you expect. Okay. So you have the expectation that your child should understand certain things. So let's say you give your child a book to read. All right. Pretty soon in a homeschool setting, there's no way the teacher or the parent is going to be able to keep up with all the reading. Um, only in as much as kids can glom onto a book and they can just read it and whatever. So because I couldn't read all the books, dinner time or lunch time was, you've got to tell us what the story was. You have to tell us what it was about. And then I would ask questions. So for example, I remember Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer. My daughter liked reading Mark Twain books. So she would tell us the story and everything else. And then I'd ask the question, so what do you think the author thinks about Christianity and Christians? Oh, well, then she would talk about some of the caricatures he had of the pastor or the minister or whatever, and what was highlighted as a good thing and what was highlighted as a bad thing. Mm -hmm. If your child can't answer those kinds of questions in terms of a book or a story that's been read, it means that you have to go in and lay a foundation so that your child is thinking, okay, how does this story and the point of view that's being communicated relate to God's law? Right. So if the hero of the story feels all the time, then you have to evaluate it in terms of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we want to look and see if these things that we're evaluating, whether it's, um, you know, the book or whether or not we test or what kind of 
extracurricular activities we get into, all those things. We're back again, always to assessing what is it that we really are supposed to be doing here. And that's one of the things that we hope to do with Appomattox Area Family Educators is to, you know, help moms see that what really just that, what are we supposed to be doing? So let me say this. There are there is going to be a place for standardized testing. So you may decide, OK, we're going to do something a little interesting at this point we are going to have standardized test week. So you can create your own standardized test. It's not that hard, you know, just come up with questions and find a way to see if the things that you've been trying to communicate are in fact being learned. Um, essay answers are also a great way to find out how well your child can communicate in writing and what it is that your child thinks. So when I was teaching a homeschool co-op writing class, uh, the final assignment was I gave a, a bunch, like 10 different scenarios of which the students had to pick three. And it was a moral dilemma. So I created a situation that there was a moral dilemma. How would you solve this dilemma? Well, it's amazing the theology that came out of that writing. Mm -hmm. Some people decided that the best thing to do would be to hide it because let's avoid problems with parents. Others felt that you had to tell them because you would feel terrible if you didn't. And then I let the parents see the answers if they wanted to. I said, you know, this is what your child thinks. So this is a way in which you can evaluate because if you don't ask someone to tell you what it is they think, they'll get used to telling you what they think you want to hear. You want to hear, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the child's ability to communicate what your, what your mission statement is, not necessarily just verbatim, but to be able to live and function in terms of that and to be able to, to explain that and to be able to assess whether or not their behavior or their their um, these scenarios would be in terms with God's law. So that again requires though that the parents know what that is, right? And not uh, because they can't teach it to the children. They can't they can't pass that down to the children. So that goes all the way back in my mind to starting with testing and realizing what do you want to be on the test? We've got to go back to God's law, recognize that's an objective standard and, and make that be the, the really that's got to be the standard. God's right. word has to be the standard. So I said before, and I never actually got to the point why you might need to become proficient at taking standardized tests. Okay. Well, in California, the state I live in, in order for someone to be deemed done with high school, they can either take a proficiency exam, which is an equivalent of the exit exam that matriculating students have to take out of the public schools, or the you know GED, which means that let's say you are over 18 and you want to take a test to prove that you have the same equivalent knowledge as a high school graduate. Well, by what you told me for the state that you're familiar with, the standards are not that high. So right. it's probably not going to be a real chore to meet that threshold. But for those who want to pursue a college education, um, there are tests, the SATs, that they may choose to take. Mm -hmm. So being familiar with how to take a standardized test how to approach multiple choice answers to be able to look at for the clues or the cues as to not pick this answer or not. It's not that it's not a valuable skill to learn. You can learn that skill, but don't confuse it with being educated because right. it's not the same thing. Right. Because the test and the evaluation are not necessarily uh, the same thing. Otherwise there's tests, you know, to demonstrate your mastery of a subject. And those are very important. You wouldn't want to be able to, uh, you wouldn't hire a plumber if they had not demonstrated their mastery of that skill. 
And so but isn't it also the case, Nancy, that sometimes we get a plumber who turns out not to know what he's doing. <laughs> so it, it's That's not right. so much that we see all their credentials ahead of time. People prove themselves by how excellent they do their work. If a college degree, for example, or a law degree was a measure of moral excellence, then our country should be great because our Congress is made up of people who have degrees and are lawyers and whatever, but somehow or other, the moral fiber of the country isn't reflected in the laws that get made and the way in which they choose to govern. So we don't want to put too much emphasis on the humanistic standards of achievement because there are lots of ways people learn. It's not always by reading. Sometimes it's by listening. Sometimes it's by interacting with others who know something. Mm -hmm. Right. And regardless of how our students learn, regardless of how our, of of how we teach, um, the Holy Spirit with us has promised to lead us into all truth. And God's word tells us those more, most important things in life. So we, we want to make sure that we are, are looking to those as the ultimate test, the ultimate standard. And as always, Andre, whenever we talk to you, um, we, we get to just bust through these humanistic ideas and artificial measures and you know, really examine our expectation, our purpose and the, the plans for, for what we do and why we do it. Right. Let me say Um, this. You have to have a vision of victory when you're homeschooling. You have to believe that God does work all things together for the good, for those who love him and those who are the called according to his purpose. If you don't believe that, and you don't live it, then you're a practical atheist. We don't want to be practical atheists. We want to be self-conscious Christians who say, look, God created my child. God placed my child in my family. God knows the raw materials we both have that he instilled in us. Mm -hmm. If we keep our hand to the plow and do it in terms of serving God and being faithful and wanting to build the kingdom of God, then count on the success. Uh, Victory is an important part of the Christian life. And if you don't embrace it, then you're acting as though the calling that God has given you in terms of giving your children a Christian education is doomed to failure. That's not who our God is. If we're faithful, he delivers on what he promised. And if our focus remains on the kingdom of God, then Everything else, including being educated, will be added unto us according to God's promise. Um, By means of an example of something that will help guide this woman and other people you run in are in touch with, Rush Dooney's The Philosophy of the Christian Curriculum is very helpful in terms of looking at each subject. And then I would shamelessly plug my two books. Lessons Learned from Years of Homeschooling and the Homeschool Life, which are much more in terms of a philosophical approach and orientation to chill out and know that God is God. In other words, realize that you're on a track in terms of obedience and God blesses obedience. Yes, he does. does. Thank you, Andrea. So I'm sure that you put up links to that so that folks can come and find those two books. And per- they can purchase them at calcedon.com. Are they available? Uh, calcedon.edu. Oh, edu. Sorry. 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 And they can also get all of those on Amazon if that's an easier way for them to make their purchase. Mm-hmm. Right. And also, Andrea, I don't, I, I don't want to skip out without saying again that for those moms who – really don't have a good grasp on what God requires of us, what the law of God really means. I want to um, just say again, to go look at the Teacher Training Institute. Can you talk about that right quick again, too? Yeah. So um, 
It's not so important that you learn how to teach algebra, although it'll be useful, or you learn how to, you know, teach the parts of the speech, which will be useful, is that you know and understand God's law so that it can be the umbrella over everything you do. And you can find that information at the Calcine Teacher Training Institute.com or if you're better with initials, ctti.org. Okay. Very good. Well, it looks like we're out of time here, Miss Andrea, but I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week. Yes. And I hope you have a good week. And again, if anybody would like to uh, contact either one of us directly, you can find us on Facebook or just put a message on the Calcedon site and we will get it. That's so, right. And if there's, if there's something that they want to hear us talk about, they're welcome yeah. to say that too. Okay. God bless you. And thanks again, everybody for listening. Yes, ma'am. 